Welcome back, everyone. This is Dennis Jenke. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about LVPs, maybe this time more technical than the introduction, and specifically about um, how we can use auxiliary information to support the development and qualification of flexible packaging for LVPs. Essentially, we'll talk a little bit about what auxiliary information is, how it can be used to um, facilitate the development of packaging, specifically with respect to material selection. Then we'll get back into the to this topic of the, the AET gap, you know, the, the uh, difficulty with which um, we can detect compounds in, uh, in an extract or in a drug product down to the levels required by LVP. And specifically, we're going to look at three ways to manage that gap. Analytically, via the use of a simulation study, at least from an introductory perspective, and via what I call the preponderance of evidence, which is using auxiliary information. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll wrap it all up with uh, a couple suggestions on uh, how to successfully manage the AET gap. Okay, so what is, what is auxiliary information? Well, auxiliary information is any information that you can get other than an extractables profile on, on the packaging system that speaks to the safe use of medical packaging and its materials of, of construction. You know, so think, think of it as, as if you were conducting a trial. You know, a primary information in a trial would be something like a confession. Yeah, I confess that I did it or a video that shows a person committing the crime. You know, that would be primary information. Secondary information would be, well, yeah, I don't have a confession or I don't have a, you know, video showing them stealing the watch or whatever, whatever it is, you know, so I've got to, I've got to somehow convince you with other evidence. It's, uh, uh, you know, yeah, we, we can put him at the scene of the crime, and uh, yeah, he's got a billion bills to pay, so he has a motive to steal something, so on and so on and so forth. So it's indirect. It's indirect uh, evidence. And, you know, the, the kind of indirect evidence that might be useful um, in, in this particular case are uh, compliance with the, uh, uh, the relevant pharmacopoeia. You know, so for example, the USP chapter on plastics and the uh, Farm European, the European Pharmacopeia chapters on uh, uh, materials and the containers, uh, the results of biocompatibility testing, a conformity to uh, relevant food contact regulations, a compliance with compositional regulations and standards like REACH and Proposition 65 here in the United States, and the formulation. You know, knowing the formulation of a material of construction is auxiliary uh, information. You know, so that, that's what auxiliary information is. The way we use auxiliary information when we're designing our LVP packaging is to recognize, um, you know, I, I, it, it's a completely logical um, concept. And that's that the most effective way to ensure that your LVP packaging is safe is to use materials of construction that are safe. Okay. You know, so how do you do that? How do, how do you establish that a material of construction is safe to use? You know, I guess, the, I guess the gold standard is you would, you know, you would have some clinical testing, you know, the likelihood that you would have that is relatively, relatively low. Um, maybe the vendor of the material of construction might provide you with some kind of extractables profiling done on the, on the material. And maybe even the extractables profile has to been toxicologically risk assessed. Um, but, you know, as valuable as that information can be, 
you know, you're stuck with the idea that it's case by case. You know, did they use the solvents that are relevant to me and the time and temperature? Is it right? Um, you know, they tested the material before processing. I gamma irradiated, you know, so how good are, how good are the results? You know, so arguably having an extractables profile from a materials vendor is a, a two-edged sword, but, you know, any information is valuable information. And then, the, like, as I said, the preponderance of re relevant uh, evidence, maybe the vendor has done, uh, uh, you know, bio biocompatibility testing and uh, maybe, uh, you yeah, know, certainly I would think that they would, they've done compendial. Uh, tests, maybe the material is used in food contact applications, and so on and so on and so forth. And, you know, again, all this at this point, all this information is used to help you make the decision, should I use this material of construction in my packaging? The other point that I would make is that that information is a useful aspect of the packaging systems regulatory file. Now, you, you, you notice the asterisk, and the asterisk is important because, uh, you know, I don't want to leave the impression that with this auxiliary information, one could complete an acceptable regulatory file for an LVP packaging system. You can't. You know, no, no regulator based just on, um, you know, auxiliary information would approve a file. But 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 I think it's I think it's important to people who think that their file is well yeah well we throw an extractables report and a leachables report and a tax assessment in there and and that'll be good and that'll be good enough you know that's not that's not good enough because there'll be gaps there'll be questions there'll be issues um, there'll be lack of understanding you know you need you in your regulatory file you need to tell a story. And part of the story that you need to tell is that I intentionally picked my, my materials of construction because I believe that they're safe. And this is, this is why. It, it, it provides a useful commentary. It, it provides useful context, especially when there are gray areas. And there will be gray areas with LVP. OK? Again, the, the, the logic here is it's, it's not rocket scientists. It's pretty straightforward. A material that complies with the compendia is likely to be safe for use in medical applications. That's why the compendia exists. A material that's biocompatible is likely to be safe. It's not a guarantee, but it's likely to be safe. If a material is used in food packaging, it's likely to be safe in medical packaging and so on and so on and so forth. Again, all these, all these indiv individual pieces of information help us tell the story that our packaging system is likely to be safe even before we do the rigorous extractables and leachables and tax assessment. Now let's switch gears a little bit. You know, we've selected our materials, we have a packaging system, and now we need to qualify it. I don't think I need at this point in time to spend anything, any, any significant time with the AET. Just to remind us, the AET is the line in the sand that separates those compounds that we have to report for tax assessment from those compounds that are safe that don't need to be reported. I just want to make two points. You know, but you'll hear me refer to this, the AET as being protective. Well, the AET is protective of patient health because it assures that all compounds that are possible safety hazards are risk assessed. You know, so the AET protects patient safety by making sure we assess those compounds that could be unsafe. The other thing that, uh, to, uh, to make sure that we remember is the AET is a concept that's applied when we screen drug products for unspecified leachables, or we screen extracts for unspecified uh, uh, extractables, organic um, extractables. Okay, so that's what we need to remember about the AET. You know, again, maybe you've seen this picture uh, three or four times. I know I've shown it at least, uh, at least once. It's just a visual uh, confirmation of what the AET is. The internal standard is spiked into your sample at the AET 
a, in essence, a line is drawn on the chromatogram. Every peak above the line has to be reported for tax assessment. Every peak below the line is, is presumed to be safe. All right. Okay, so here's the problem. Here's the problem with LVPs. The problem with LVPs is the AET is so low. The AET is drawn so far down in the chromatogram that many analytical techniques that are routinely used for screening can't get that low. The limit of detection isn't as low as the AET. That means that there's going, there is the potential that there'll be peaks in the chromatogram that fall within the, that region, the, with the AET gap region, where the analytical method just can't get down. I, you know, I know this picture is, is distorted a little bit. It's distorted by, because the, of illustration purposes. Uh, but if this, was, if this was a true chromatogram and this line was really the L -E -L -L LOD, we would barely see these peaks above the, base, above the baseline. But in, in this particular picture, they're well above the baseline, but they illustrate the fact that there could be peaks that fall in that gap. I, again, by the definition of the AET, these compounds have to be reported. By the definition of the limit of detection, I can't detect these compounds. So we have an AET gap. Why do we have an LVP, an, an AET gap? Again, because LVPs are large volume, uh, large maximum daily dose volumes, and the LODs can be high for certain LVPs because of their complex chemical formulation. Again, the issue with that AET gap is, you know, that the, you got a monster under your bed. When you're sleeping in your bed, you can't even see if there's a monster underneath there or not. You know, you're, so you're, 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 scared, you're always scared that the monster is there, but you got no way to confirm it until he jumps out and gets you. It's the same thing. It's the same thing here. Analytically, you can't establish whether there are compounds above the AET that need to be reported or not. And if you can't, if you don't know that, the AET is no longer protected. Okay, so potential solutions to the AET gap. You know, so the good news is there are there are solutions. You know, I have them in in parentheses. Um, you know, they're they're not always solutions. They're not always complete solutions, but there are some things that you can do to manage the AET gap. There's an analytical option, uh, what I call a conceptual option and a logical option. The analytical option is, is, is obvious. I do something to the analytical chemistry to either um, lower the limit of detection or I'm going to raise the AET so that the gap gets, gets smaller. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do analytically. How do I accomplish? How do I accomplish that? Well, you know, the, the number of different ways to increase the sensitivity of your analytical method. You know, you can buy, you can buy the latest and the greatest uh, instrumentation because, you know, every, every year it seems a, a vendor comes out with an instrument that has greater uh, sensitivity. Uh, you can optimize your analytical method for sensitivity. You know, the, these analytical methods that we use to screen uh, drug products for unspecified leachables are a compromise. You know, they compr the, the balance is sensitivity versus a broad scope, okay? So, um, you know, if you really get sensitivity constrained, maybe you give up some of the broad scope in order to improve sensitivity. You can adopt multiple methods. You know, so as you, as you narrow the gap or narrow the, the, the scope of each individual method, maybe you bring more methods online uh, so that those, those, those gaps are closed. And then, the, then there's always the uh, sample prep. You know, you, I can concentrate my drug product or do a liquid-liquid extraction, uh, so on and so forth, to, to accomplish one or uh, two things hopefully to eliminate the matrix interferences and to concentrate the, uh, the analytes. Okay, so that's what you can do for the LOD. Well, what can you do with the AET? Well, uh, you know, you can't, you can't change the point of departure for the AET. You know, the tox uh, the threshold that the AET is based on can't be changed. 
But one of the things you can do is reduce the uncertainty factor that's required to adjust the AET lower. And I only know two ways uh, to reduce the uncertainty factor. One is to use a detection method which has highly reproducible response factors. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that not all detection methods are, are created equal. Some have uh, response factors that are all over the place. Some have response factors that are relatively tight. You know, so if you use detection methods with highly reproducible response factors, your uncertainty factor adjustment goes down. The other thing is to adopt a multi uh, a multi method approach. You know, so you might use GC and LC, uh, maybe GC with MS detector and LC with a number of different detectors. When you adopt the multi method uh, approach, the uh, uncertainty factor goes down. Okay, so that's how we that's how we manage the AET gap analytically. Conceptually, how we manage the AET gap is to uh, eliminate the shortcomings of, of uh, LVPs, and specifically the uh, shortcomings of LVPs that you're looking to eliminate are the complexity of the uh, drug formulation, uh, the amount of time that it takes a full uh, shelf life a study, and um, you, know, you, you exaggerate. The, the test conditions. And this is called the simulation study. And I'm not going to get into a simulation study now because we'll be coming back to that topic a little bit a little bit later. But, but that's a conceptual approach where you simulate the drug product and do an accelerated uh, stability-like study. What I wanted to talk uh, a little bit more of is the logical solution to the AET gap, the preponderance of evidence approach. In other words, I'm going to try to convince a jury, trying to convince a regulator, that the preponderance of evidence establishes that my packaging is safe, and therefore that the possibility that the packaging is unsafe is vanishingly small, or accept, at least acceptably small. This is, I call this, I call this the um, three little pigs. The three little pigs approach to um, uh, safety assessment. Then, and, and you know, we all know the story of the three little pigs. The lazy little pigs build their houses out of uh, uh, poor materials, and the wolf blows them down. The same thing is true with a packaging system. If you if you build your packaging system out of poorly chosen materials of construction, more likely than not, the, the big bad regulatory agency is going to look at your file and blow your house down and say that the final file is not uh, not good enough. So that's the logic of the preponderance of evidence approach. The preponderance of evidence approach is based on essentially four different pillars: biocompatibility, conformance to the compendia, approvable approved for use with food, and what I call clean composition. And we'll just talk very quickly about each one of these. Uh, but before before we do that, before we do that, you know, it's a reasonable question to ask. Well, Dennis, you know, this is a great idea, the preponderance of evidence. You know, I know it works in the courtroom. It's, but does it work with the regulatory agencies? Well, it should. It should because it's part of the regulations. Um, you know, both the um, container closure guidance in the United States and the guideline on plastic immediate packaging materials in Europe talk about the use of a preponderance of evidence. You know, so for example, you can see in both of these cases, they talk about things like appropriate reference to indirect food additive regulations. They talk about it described in the European Pharmacopeia um, and so on and so on and so forth. You know, again, compliance with food stuff uh, legislation. So, you know, the idea of preponderance of evidence is not foreign to uh, regulatory authorities. They, they, they've heard this argument before. The other thing that I would point out about, out about this preponderance of evidence approach is three of the four pillars are based on extraction studies. You know, when you do a biocompatibility assessment, you extract the test article first, 
The only difference between that and an extractable study is instead of using analytical tests, you use biological tests. But it, it, it's still an extraction and a, and a test. So in concept, it's the same as extractables testing. Conformance to compendia. You know, the European and the US uh, compendia for plastic materials used in, in packaging are based on extraction. Now you don't screen those extract, ex, extracts for extractables, but you do do tests that are, are generally indicative of extractables. So for example, if you measure the UV absorbance of a water extract, well, that tells you how many, you know, the quantity of UV absorbing uh, extractables. You can't tox assess that number, but you know what, if I, I guarantee you, if the UV absorbance is low, then the number of extractables that you have in that extract is also likely, is also likely to be low. And lastly, but 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 uh, not least, is uh, compliance with the, the way that you establish your plastic material complies with food uh, uh, regulations. Is you do extractions, you do extractions, and you look for substances of 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 special concern or high or high concern or intentional additives, so on and so on and so forth. So my point here is that three of the four pillars in the preponderance of evidence approach are based on extractable information. It's just not what we're used to seeing as extractables information, but it is extractables information. The last, the last pillar, the pillar based on composition. Well, you know, again, the logic is obvious. A compound can't be leachable in a drug product if it isn't present in the packaging system in the first place. That's the value in knowing the composition, okay? The gold standard in terms of having compositional evidence is, of course, if the vendor gives you the formulation. That doesn't happen, uh, that doesn't happen 100%. You know, it, it 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 it's just a it's just a fact of the uh, of the reality the the reality that um, you you can't always get uh, the formulation. Um, you 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 can get formulation information from compliance to compositional standards. You know, so for example, if the if the, uh, the material complies with the reach regulations, that means it contains a no. Uh, a, a reach uh, registered uh, unsafe compounds at levels uh, consistent with the standard. The same thing is true with uh, uh, California Proposition 65 or um, uh, you know compliance for heavy metals and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, so that gives you some information with respect to composition. The 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 point that I want to warn you about, or the point that I want to emphasize, that maybe makes that information a little bit less valuable, is the significant difference between not intentionally added and confirmed to be ab absence. I've seen many of these these uh, statements from vendors in terms of reach compliance or Prop sixty five compliance or heavy metals compliance, where the language is well, they're not intentionally added. And that's good to know. You know, again, don't get me wrong. That's good to know. It's good to know that you don't intentionally add that these things. But that's a lot different than confirmed to be absent. You know, and I think I think the regulators are going to hold people to task if they if they don't understand. They don't understand the difference. That things get into plastics that were never intended uh, to be there for for a variety. You know, and it's not sinister. You know, it's not sinister. There's many. Um, uh, perfectly logical and, and understandable reasons why a compound is, that's not intentionally added ends up in a plastic. Okay, I just wanted to end the presentation with um, a little bit of practical advice in terms of uh, th ways that I've had success with dealing with the AET gap in the regulatory submissions. And uh, you know, I, I spent a lifetime, a lifetime managing the, the AET gap, sometimes with good success and sometimes with not so not so good success. You know, the first thing that I would, the first bit of advice I would give you is acknowledge that the gap exists. You know, the agency, if, if, if there are issues in your regulatory file, the agency wants you to acknowledge those issues up front. You know, so just do that. 
just show the chromatogram with the LOD and the AET and say, hey, we've got a gap. Uh, the next thing to do is quantify the size of the gap. You know, how you manage the gap depends upon the size of the gap. You know, if your LOD and AET are only are off by a, a factor of two, you know, realistically, that's a, a completely different ballpark than if your AET and LOD is off by an order of magnitude. You know, so quantify the size of the gap and speak to, uh, you know, how much risk is really associated with the, you know, the gap. I mean, if I have a gap that's a factor of two, I'm within the, the reproducibility of my analytical, my analytical method. I don't think that's much a gap at all. The other thing you want to do is you want to tell a story. You want to tell the agency what you did to try to minimize that gap. You know, they're going to they're going to they're going to walk with you a little bit, walk along the path with you a little bit. If you're able to demonstrate that you exercise due diligence, you know, hey, I tried to optimize my analytical methods. I tried different sample preps. Uh, you know, I, I, I tried this and I tried I tried that, um, you know, tell them a story. I mean, you know, don't make it a book. <laughs> don't make it a book. But, you know, give them the sense that you actively uh, optimized your analytical method to try to minimize the gap. Consider performing a simulation extractable study. Just be aware that um, the, the regulatory perspective associated with the design and use of simulation studies, which is that the regulatory authorities um, require that simulation conditions be justified. You know, so if you're going to perform a simulation study, you better be prepared to justify that simula simulation study and your justif justification has to be credible. Uh, you know, collect your available preponderance of evidence information and create your safe use defense. You know, collect that information. Try to create the um, uh, the feeling in the mind of the reviewer that these materials are safe intrinsically, and therefore that the leachables assessment in tox uh, is is icing on the cake. You know the cake was built the cake was cooked fine. I just need to put icing on it. And then last but not least, you know effectively and completely tell your story. You know, so much of a successful uh, submission is not about what's in the submission. Of course, the, the submission can't be deficient, but it's how you tell your story, how you convince the regulator that based on a, a preponderance of information, not just one piece of evidence, but many pieces of information, that your packaged drug product is safe. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions.